Hey, welcome all friends, neighbors, brothers, sisters. Today is October 15th. The Gregorian calendar reads 2016. It is 7.49 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, before I get to uh, the meat of this video, which is going to be reading con number three from John Truman Wolfe's essay, Anatomy of a Con Job, uh, I wanted to tell you about this, uh, this situation that um, uh, somebody very close to me has uh, gotten themselves involved with. Uh, so, you know, that you can kind of think about it and maybe, maybe keep your eyes open um, so that maybe something like this doesn't happen to you or somebody who you care about. Um, this person is, um, uh, I think this person's a, a, a very spirit-led person. Um, this is a person who I would say is genuinely in, uh, Christ Jesus, our Lord, and is thus reconciled to God, um, filled with the Spirit of God. Um, I mean, what else can I say, you know? Um, and, and therefore lives a good and righteous life, um, does what he can, um, and what he is able to do as far as, um, performing God's will. Um, and he has a public profession of Christ. All of the things that you would want to see in in somebody who you would want to call a brother uh, recently um i'm afraid that he's gotten involved with uh, a congregation that um well if you don't want to call it a cult um, maybe at least extremely legalistic. Uh, you see that this congregation that he's gotten himself involved with now, um, well, they, okay. From what I know, what I've heard, they, um, they do not allow uh, those who are uh, uh, part of their their congregation. Uh, they do not they do not allow these people to um, uh, murder, commit adultery, dishonor their parents. And they don't let them steal. Um, I mean, they they preach against coveting. Uh, they preach against uh, making idols and bowing down to them. Uh, and those are just some things off the top of my head that I know that they are um, encouraging him to do. Um, and I'm I'm really afraid for him. Um, because I'm not sure what this kind of occultic or, or in the least, very legalistic activity is going to lead him to. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm really afraid that if he stays there and keeps this up, um, that he may, uh, he may very well, um, grow in the Lord and, um, become a, a more loving husband and father, um, a more well-respected, good and righteous man in his community. Um, and, 
you know, I, I can just see all of this, you know, going in that sort of a direction. Um, and uh, so, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just really concerned. I'm really concerned, you know, about those places that um, teach those sort of legalistic things. No. So, maybe you can watch out for congregations like that. So, um, <clears throat> for any of you with any kind of discernment, of course, you, you obviously would be thinking while I was saying that, that that's absurd. Well, of course, a good congregation would encourage those things. Any of you that wouldn't be thinking that, you either weren't paying attention, or maybe you were taught um, very poorly, like the way that I was taught by a lot of uh, lawless preachers. It's a ridiculous sort of uh, dualism how so many um, preachers and whatnot, um, they teach, they teach that um, striving to keep the commandments of God could be legalism, and at the same time they would say that they were good, because they don't really know, they, they want to tell us that we're not under the law, but by nature, naturally, they do these things. They must be confused. I don't know if they ever take the time to think about these things. Now what that's bringing me to is the fact that today is the seventh day of the week. It's the Sabbath. The Sabbath was never by God, by our Lord Jesus Christ, recorded in Holy Scripture, never changed to the first day of the week. <clears throat> it was always the seventh day of the week, and it remains the seventh day of the week. Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So, if you think that it's absurd that any church uh, assembly, body, at a church building, or anything uh, of the like, would teach something like, well, you know, if, if you've got this ridiculous idea in your head that you shouldn't murder, that's kind of legalistic. Or that you shouldn't commit adultery. Well, of course, no one would teach that. Beyond, because they understand that that is the very foundation of the moral law of God. And those those instructions, those Ten Commandments, they don't have any ethnic ties to them whatsoever. They were given to humanity, and they were expected to be kept by all those who would be God's people. So it's funny that there is no other body that would call themselves a Christian church who would ever teach that any of the other nine commandments were to be broken. They would in fact teach you that that is sin, and that you should not do it. But when they come to commandment number four, oh, that's a different story. They either foolishly think that it was done away, and Jesus would never do away with one of the Ten Commandments, or they erroneously believe that it was changed. You need to pay attention to the conversations that Jesus has with the Pharisees, and it's always with the Pharisees, concerning the things that he's doing on the Sabbath, how they have to do with God's hierarchy of what is good and acceptable to do with the Sabbath, and specifically who he is and what he was claiming 
because, as he said, the Son of Man even is the Lord of the Sabbath. But he did not do away with it. He did not change it. And it is still God's fourth commandment. And as we learn in 1 John 3, 4, what is sin? Sin is lawlessness. And that's a fact. So I would encourage everyone out there who has a great desire to obey their God and Father, their Lord and Savior, to consider why you are breaking the fourth commandment. It doesn't matter if you entirely understand it or not, <clears throat> but like with the other commandments, I believe that we should strive, if we are in fact God's people, to keep it. They're His commandments. And He says that keeping these commandments is good, is moral, is right in His eyes. We aren't saved by keeping them, but because we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, because of this, we are saved to good works. We are free because we are not condemned, and we may do the works of God. And if His commandments are not His will, well, you're going to have a really tough time figuring out what is. If you say, well, we should just heed the words of Jesus Christ, Jesus himself said, he speaks nothing but the words of the Father. He says he does nothing but what he sees the Father doing. So you tell me how he was doing something opposed to what God did, does, is and says. Food for thought. So, <clears throat> let's move on here to, okay, con number three. If you remember in our last exciting episode, we were doing con number two, uh, which is all about oil. It's not a fossil fuel. It's abiotic. It's entirely renewable. There is information out there beyond John Truman Wolf's essay here, Anatomy of a Con Job, that you can look into and you find these things out for yourself. Oil is not a fossil fuel and it's extraordinarily renewable. And there is a lot of it in this earth on which we live. So he said this last little bit right here, lies one and all which leads us to the granddaddy of con, con number three. And here we go with con number three, global warming, climate change, which is uh, the heart and soul of uh, Pope Francis, former Cardinal George Bergoglio of Argentina, the overseer of the dirty war, the heart and soul of his encyclical Laudato Si that he put out last year is all this. Everything John Truman Wolf's talking about was absolutely covered by Pope Francis and as if it were true and a fact. So either poor old Pope Francis is confused or he is just being what he is, which is a lying Jesuit who wouldn't know the truth if it hit him upside the head. Unfortunately, he's, he's so blind in his wickedness, I don't think he would know the truth. And I think the truth to him is the utter enemy. So here we go with Wolf's paper, con number three. <clears throat> The heart-wrenching icon of a lone polar bear hovering in solitude somewhere in the rapidly disappearing Arctic has become the environmental movement's most poignant pitchman. 
The pitch, however, is bogus. The bears are booming. According to the Wall Street Journal, quote, nearly everyone agrees that there are more polar bears now than when scientists first started counting. Estimates put the population between 20,000 and 25,000, up from several thousand 50 years ago. In Canada, where two-thirds of the world's bears live, most populations have grown during the past two or three decades. Arctic residents say they are now bumping into bears wherever they turn. The polar bear debate cuts to the heart of the foundation on which the environmental movement rests, global warming. While the Club of Rome clarion call for sustainable development in the limits to growth turned out to be more than a little thin on scientific credibility, and the theory that oil is a scarce and rapidly depleting fossil fuel is untrue. The holy grail of the environmental movement is global warming, or, as they have renamed it due to the last 11 years of embarrassingly cooler temperatures, climate change. It is the creed upon which the movement is built. And you can watch a video that entirely backs what he just set up about there being no warming whatsoever. Um, you can just punch in Ted Cruz Sierra Club and you will see his exchange with the president of the Sierra Club concerning climate change. And we're going to actually watch a little bit of something with Cruz and climate change and maybe talk about that a little bit. So, all right, back to the paper. Okay, it is the creed upon which the movement is built. Uh, the scripture is as follows. The burning of fossil fuels produce carbon dioxide. This and other greenhouse gases create global warming, which will destroy the planet. Probably in the same way that dinosaurs' gas killed them. That's just coming from me. To wit, the production of these gases must be, quote-unquote, capped. Legislation to suppress their use is a first step. Population control, a reduction of the planet's population, that means people, is the real answer. Because man makes these gases. Fewer people mean less greenhouse gas. Less greenhouse gas means less global warming. Less warming means the earth is saved. Because the earth needs to be saved, right? Oh, man. He goes on to say, Amen. Yeah, and I am throwing a lot of my own commentary in there, kind of seamlessly. So, you know what? This is why I suggest with anything I read, pretty much, that you either follow the links that I usually provide and read it for yourself. Or get it for yourself. Purchase it for yourself if it's a book or anything. Read it for yourself because this is how I do. So, you know, at those things are going to happen. Okay, here we go. Greenhouse gases, by the way, are any of the atmospheric gases such as water vapor and carbon dioxide that are said to contribute to the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is a name for the phenomenon outlined above whereby the Earth's atmosphere traps solar radiation and thereby overheats the planet. According to the theory, these gases in the atmosphere allow sunlight to pass through to the Earth, but then absorb the heat radiated back from the planet's surface. Shazam! Global warming. Sounds good. Cut CO2 and you save the world. A clearly identified evil with an action plan to handle it. Kind of like the Inquisition. Fry the heretics. Purify the faith. Now, I would go on to say, since John Truman Wolf does not share the same mind that, uh, that I do, that it is uh, far more than kind of like the Inquisition. I think these are the fundamental building blocks to fully reinstituting the Inquisition. Because the Office of Inquisition never got closed. 
Okay. So, today, global warming heretics are burned in the media, not at the stake. But the dogma is no less strident, no less authoritarian, no less despotic. And I say that it's just a matter of time before it is back to the stake. Science settled. Al Gore is the Moses of global warming. He, along with the high priests of the movement, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, has pronounced that the science regarding man-made global warming is settled. There's nothing further to discuss. Global warming is real, man-made, CO2 is the cause, carbon production must be capped. Done deal. Al and the IPCC are simpatico on this, which is cool. Harmony in the ranks. The Oregon Petition. But here's the deal. Uh, 31,486 scientists have signed a document called the Oregon Petition lambasting the shoddy research behind global warming, stating quite simply that any human contribution to climate change has not been demonstrated. This is not a gang of political hacks or George Soros-funded quote-unquote activists. No, the signatories include 3,667 atmospheric, environmental, and earth scientists, 4,796 chemists, 2,924 biologists, and agricultural scientists, 903 math and computer scientists, and 9,992 in engineering and general science. Of these, 9,000 29 have PhDs. The petition states that there is no convincing scientific evidence that the human release of carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases is causing or will cause global warming. It goes on to say that there is substantial scientific evidence demonstrating that atmospheric carbon dioxide produces countless beneficial effects on the plant and animal population of Earth. In one of Mother Nature's most spectacular touches of environmental magic, plants convert carbon dioxide and sunlight into oxygen. You know, the stuff we breathe. Senate Committee on the Environment in March of 2009, the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works posted a report of more than 700 international scientists dissenting on the theory of man-made global warming. Several of those joining in on this report were current or former IPCC members. Several other groups of scientists have issued statements blasting the lack of credible science behind the theory that man-made carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere contribute to global warming. Examples include the statement by atmospheric scientists on greenhouse warming, the Leipzig Declaration on Global Climate Change, and the Heidelberg Appeal. The IPCC cooks the books. Go figure. You will notice if you read articles about the environment that facts regarding global warming invariably cite the IPCC as their source. In short, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is the planet's opinion leader on the subject of man-made climate change. <laughs> Go figure. Ah, jeez. Okay. Or at least they were. On November 19th, 2009, one of the largest scientific scandals in history exploded across the international media when thousands of internal emails were linked exposing the organization's blatant manipulation of climate data. The emails revealed that the IPCC had skewed bucket loads 
of climate information to promote the idea that global warming was a result of an increase in man-made carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So, in 2009, all of this comes out, and why haven't any of us heard about it? Well, for one thing, we're all too busy with all of the other superficial information that we're being fed constantly to keep the important scandals like this out of the limelight. And of course, neither the mainstream media nor the alternative media is talking about this, what it means, and where it's coming from, and connecting the dots. They're not doing it. So, this wasn't a bunch of stoners in a frat house passing the filched answers to the Geology 101 midterm around. These guys were recognized as the world's leading quote-unquote authorities on climate change, caught red-handed in an intentional plot to mislead environmental groups, governments, and the public at large about the current and future state of the planet's temperature. It's amazing. It is amazing. And what I find even more amazing than that is if you were to if you were to get this out, let's say, because I can't speak for how it would be in the rest of the world, you know, because us in America here, we are given so much propaganda every day concerning the other countries in the world and what the populations are like and what they believe. So I can't really say what it would be like in the rest of the world, but I can speak for how it would go in America if you put this story out there from coast to coast and at least got it in front of everybody's face and in everybody's ears. The sad part is that most people wouldn't have the time or the, the unction to get up, get out, or to write their congressman, do something, and tell them, look here, we're not going to put up with you supporting the measures that this criminal worldwide enterprise known as the UN is doing. We're not going to put up with it. And if we even get wind that you're supporting this or any of these people, we are going to make sure that you are out of a job as soon as possible. Even if that means removing you before your term is up. That's supposed to be the way things go in this country. That was founded based on laws. I'm not talking about anyone doing something unlawful. You have to understand that. I'm not. I'm saying we live in a country of laws. And we have all kinds of people that are breaking these laws. And since it's a country of laws, we are within our lawful rights to do certain things, to say certain things, to refuse to do certain things. That is the wonderful thing that Christians who believed that man should be able to have a certain amount of dignity and freedom because he was endowed with his creator, or by his creator, with certain unalienable rights. It's not self-evident, it's biblically evident, but it is so. You see, we live in a country of laws because these people a few hundred years ago believed in that. 
so it's a good thing and we need to exercise what rights we have we're not doing anything unchristian or unbiblical by exercising the rights we have in this land and acting in a lawful manner that's a good thing if we are the light and the salt which we are we need to take what freedoms we have and do what we can to not only make sure that our neighbors here have a better life but that this country stops being the enforcement arm for the Vatican led New World Order and that's what it is to speak in geopolitical terms that's precisely what it is and we need to stop our country from doing that from sending soldiers abroad to murder poor people to murder any people we've been given the responsibility and the right to be able to say no and to stop these things so that's our responsibility and we should <clears throat> now to continue forward this brief excerpt from Canada's National Post rather tells the story the climate gate emails describe how a small band of climatologists cooked the books to make the last century seem dangerously warm the emails also describe how the band plotted to rewrite history as well as science particularly by eliminating the medieval warm period a four hundred year period that began around 1000 AD the climate gate emails reveal something else too the enlistment of the most widely read source of information in the world Wikipedia in the wholesale rewriting of this history go figure the medieval warm period <laughs> like a cheap Las Vegas lounge act the pernicious cult of climate change ideologues at the IPCC desperately tried to hide the medieval warm period MWP ditch it make it disappear this was the warmest period in modern recorded history and is very well known by climatologists trying a page from Houdini's playbook the IPCC created a phony graph of historical temperatures that made the MWP presto vanish cute you see during the MWP temperatures were much warmer than they are today agriculture flourished and the Norsemen taking advantage of the ice free seas settled Greenland there's no evidence of a rise in sea level at that time none and ice sheets around Greenland were largely absent Greenland get it temperatures soared but where was the man-made carbon dioxide oil had yet to be discovered factories had not been constructed and the first model T was centuries into the future there followed a mini ice age and by 1500 the settlements in Greenland were gone and the Thames froze all the way to London there was no man-made factor in any of this these ebbs and flows of the earth's temperatures were all a product of naturally occurring phenomena which is discussed in detail below but as to the IPCC research data 
on climate change do not show that human use of hydrocarbons is harmful. To the contrary, there is good evidence that increased atmospheric carbon dioxide is environmentally helpful. From the Oregon petition. Fearmongers. In fact, the same mindset that is now promoting a the catastrophic consequences of global warming were using the same arguments almost word for word to promote the dire consequences of global cooling just a few decades ago. In 1975, Reed Bryson wrote in Global Ecology, the continued rapid cooling of the Earth since World War II is in accord with the increase in global air pollution associated with industrialization, mechanization, urbanization, and exploding population. Yeah, baby, CO2 is causing global cooling. Or consider Kenneth Watt writing on Earth Day in 1970. If present trends continue, the world will be about 4 degrees colder for the global mean temperature in 1990, but elevation degrees colder by the year 2000. This is about twice what it would take to put us into an ice age. Good call, Ken. There are more, but you get the idea. These people, then and now, are fearmongers. They get some kind of perverse joy out of frightening people. In this case, frightening them into acceptance of the greatest con job of all time. Listen to the climate chaos merchants reviewing a book by a global warming jihadist named James Hansen, who subtitles his book, The Truth About the Coming Climate Catastrophe and Our Last Chance to Save Humanity. Dr. James Hansen is Paul Revere to the foreboding tyranny of climate chaos. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Hmm. With urgency and authority, Hansen urges readers to speak out, taking to the streets if necessary to protect the earth from calamity for the sake of their children and grandchildren. Kirkus reviews. Calamity, chaos, and catastrophe, the cocaine of the global warming media extremist. Stats. The crisis and catastrophe uh, crowd don't like to talk about the fact that water vapor, not carbon dioxide, accounts for 95% of all greenhouse gases. This is naturally occurring water vapor, 99.99% of greenhouse gas. Water vapor is natural, only 0.01%, one hundredth of 1% of greenhouse water vapor is man-made. But carbon dioxide is the anointed villain of the piece. It must really pack a punch because CO2 only makes up 3.6% of greenhouse gases. And here's the kicker. Only 3% of the carbon dioxide, 3% of the 3.6% is man-made. This means 0.1%, one-tenth of 1% 1 is man-made CO2. This, according to the harbingers of climate doom, is what is driving climate catastrophe. International conferences are called, governments allocate billions in corporate PR, Departments gush over environmental agendas in a universal tsunami of green? As if someone had turned a programmed cult of global warming druids loose on the planet to shriek the horrors of carbon dioxide to a populace that doesn't know or can't confront the blatant lunacy of what they are saying. And that sounds about right. In turn, the lapdog media regurgitates the chaos and calamity to millions. Their sole aspiration is to shovel as much death, destruction, filth, and depravity into the public's mind in the shortest possible time, except somewhere in their collective soul they know, and they are sick with shame. We allow the most atrocious lies uttered by political and moral prostitutes to go unchallenged. These lies are endlessly recycled in the commercial media until they become ingrained in the public conscience as truth. Charles Sullivan <clears throat> Can I get an amen? Now, the solar connection. I'm a California boy. I love the sun. 
During spring break in college, some friends of mine and I would body surf our way down to the west coast of Mexico, turning coffee brown in the process, and return to campus as sun-baked bronze gods. The co-eds would swoon. Okay, maybe not swoon, but getting dates was definitely easier. It never occurred to me in those halcyon days that the sun might play a leading role in an article I would later write about global warming, but it does. The fact is that Earth has experienced natural warming and cooling cycles all throughout recorded history, cycles that have driven temperatures much higher than anything we are experiencing today. And what is the source of these fluctuations in the Earth's temperature? Water vapor? No. Carbon dioxide? Uh, sorry. Hairspray? You're joking. What causes temperature changes on the Earth is the Sun. Scientists have discovered that the Sun has regular cycles of sunspot activity. Sunspots are regions on the Sun's surface of intense magnetic activity. The more sunspots, the more active the Sun is. Sunspots and solar radiation activity virtually parallel temperature changes on Earth. That's right, it is the sun that is the source of global warming and cooling cycles, not mankind's carbon footprint. If greenhouse gases were the cause of global warming, how is it that from 1940 to 1975, when there was a dramatic increase in the production and release of CO2, the Earth experienced a significant cooling period? Warming periods on Earth are a direct result of an increase in solar radiation, which prevents cloud formation. Cloud formation has a cooling effect on the planet. This is further borne out by the fact that other planets in our solar system all appear to heat up at the same time, but they're not driving Chevys on Pluto or burning coal on Mars. This, then, is... Con number three. Global warming is a vast strategic PR campaign, nothing more. It is not a planetary temperature phenomenon. Sorry, Al. Most of the greatest evils that man has inflicted upon man have come through people feeling quite certain about something which, in fact, was false. Bertrand Russell. So what gives? Why all the misleading information and climate change hysteria. And then he follows this with uh, point number four, or con number four, as biofuels. But, you know, um, I didn't read that for no reason. Uh, I read that for a very good reason. Um, as I said in Pope Francis's uh, 2015 encyclical. This is the hobby horse he rides for, uh, I believe it's over 300 points of this encyclical, which are uh, each one of them a good paragraph or more long. It's a very long encyclical, which by the way, he uh, he does not forget later in the encyclical to um, praise their idol, the Virgin Mary, who bears absolutely no resemblance to the woman who bore and mothered our Lord Jesus Christ. Their Virgin Mary is the Babylonian pagan Queen of Heaven. Um, and he also uh, manages to get some... Um, Trinity action in there as well, which uh, many of you would know who haven't unsubscribed from me that I have come out uh, against the idea of a Trinity and do not believe that a Trinity is biblical. And there are a number of resources out there that you can look into to find out these things for yourself. Chief of all these resources would be the Holy Bible. Try reading it without your programmed Trinity glasses on 
and see what it has to say about God, about our Lord Jesus Christ, and about the Holy Spirit. Are they co-equal, co-eternal? Or is it a man-made doctrine? <clears throat> so, the body of this encyclical, of course, is aimed at these very things that John Truman Wolf has been talking about so far in points 1, 2, and 3. And it is the heartbeat of ideas like Agenda 21, which I understand many people don't really realize that these things are meant to justify a lot of depopulation. And when you say depopulation, that means murdering people. That is depopulation. Whether it be through um, cancer epidemics, whether it be through just uh, poisoning them at the outset of their lives with harmful, degenerative, deadly vaccines, whether it's through poisoning our soil, our water, the foods that we eat, whether it be through perverting the medical profession so that these doctors, these dentists, and these other medical professionals don't even follow the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm, but instead, because of their love of money, they do whatever they're told by the big pharmaceutical companies who are, well, between Big Pharma, the AMA, and the FDA, well, they're just as on board as every other large organization that is working towards a common goal, which is depopulation. You can read it on the Georgia Guidestones. And now, why would, let's say, the papacy, the Vatican, why would they want to so dramatically depopulate the world? Could it be that the more people you have on the earth, the harder they are to control? See, God never told us to be careful about how many children we have. Not ever. Not remotely. Not even a hint. In fact, he tells us the opposite. He tells us to be fruitful, to multiply, and to fill the earth, and to have dominion over it. You see, what's being preached in modern climate change nonsense and uh, sustainable growth nonsense and non-renewable fuel peak oil nonsense is this idea that we need to repent of our actions in using these fuels somehow damaging our environment which again as we've just seen is nonsense. When, if the Pope was truly the spiritual leader that he claims to be, he would be calling all men everywhere to repent to God, to turn away from their sins, and to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith to be baptized in his name for the forgiveness of sins, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and to do the will of God. You want to know why there's problems? Well, look at whether or not we have turned away from God 
because that is the first thing that we need to address before we can address anything else. <clears throat> I find it interesting that, uh, as I said before, if you wanted to, you could uh, just type in Ted Cruz Sierra Club, and you would see his exchange with uh, Muir. I forget his first name was Alan Muir, maybe uh, the current president of the Sierra Club uh, on the actual facts and figures to climate change. Now I find all of this interesting because the bulk of the um, public speaking. Uh, fiascos that I can find from Ted Cruz concerning climate change were things that were done um, around the time and just prior to uh, all the primaries and whatnot. Sort of as if he was given something uh, to harp on. Um, he was given a cause to champion just as the other candidates were given causes to champion and then they line them all up in a big row on a, a stage with podiums and let them hash things out and then they see who the people are um, most gullible towards. Well in this case uh, Trump won it. Sorry Ted. But here's an interesting uh, bit of an interview with Katie Couric and Ted Cruz right around the time I'm talking about. But there's no convincing evidence changes are man-made, but multiple studies, as you know, Senator, and peer-reviewed scientific journals show that at least 97% of climate scientists agree that climate warming trends over the past century are very likely due to human activities. Now, the Pope in his first major encyclical wrote, humanity is called to recognize the need for changes of lifestyle production and consumption in order to combat this warming, or at least the human causage causes which produce or aggravate it. So do all those scientists and the Pope have it wrong in your view? You know, let, let me start with you. You suggested something that I'd said, and that's not actually a quote I've said. So that, that, that okay, is not, so, not something so accurately then, attributed to All right, to then why don't you tell us um, your position? And, and I'll mention that the stat about the 97% of, of, of scientists is based on one discredited study. Uh, let me tell you what my view is. NASA has quoted that study. I know uh, that. Uh, I, and, and one of the sad things under President Obama is NASA has been politicized and has lost its core focus on space, instead pushing well, a let's, partisan agenda. Let's so, so get back to climate change. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to. And, and, you know, my view on this and everything else is that we should follow the evidence and the science and the data. You know, I'm the chairman of the Science and Space Committee of the Senate Commerce Committee. And I'm also the child of two mathematicians. Both my parents are mathematicians. My dad was, was a geophysicist for many, many years. And the problem with this debate is it is driven principally by people with partisan agendas in Washington that are disconnected Including from the science the, and the data. What about the Pope? And so let me talk about what the science and the data show. And this is funny because she actually, she, she does keep asking, what about the Pope? What about what the Pope said? And uh, we'll see later what, what he has to say. I find that really interesting, Katie Couric, uh, if you'll notice uh, when she brings up the Pope. She's just glowing. And the Pope. And the Pope says. And the Pope says. What? So that's, that's funny. Isn't that funny? Isn't that enormously hypocritical? That when guys like Kent Hovind and uh, Don Patton um, and others come out there and tell people, you know, here's real science and real science backs up the narrative of the Bible. Well, they're not scientists. They're just theologians. That's all they are. They're just theologians. What are they even doing in the realm of science? But when the Pope puts out an encyclical on something as shoddy as sustainable growth and global warming, Katie Couric is just glowing, as is everybody else in the media. When the Pope, who ought to be viewed as 
simply a theologian? Produce as an encyclical? Well, it's, that's heavy stuff. Yeah, that's heavy stuff. Everybody better stop and listen. And it's a, it's a massive, massive hypocrisy that somehow nobody is noticing. Satellite data show for the last 17 years there has been no significant recorded warming. None. Now, that's a real problem because the, the whole basis of, of global warming alarmism was based on computer models, computer models that showed there was going to be significant warming. And the problem is the satellites, when they're measuring the temperature, it's not happening. And, you know, it's interesting if you step back and look at it with some historical perspective. Uh, you and I both remember in the 1970s when there was a big push towards global cooling. We were told there was going to be a new ice age. And what happened, there were politicians who said the solution to, to global cooling was increased government control of the environment, of the economy, of energy in our lives. Well, the data didn't back that up. And so then the theory changed from global cooling to global warming. And interestingly enough, the solution was the same, more government control of the economy in our lives. But then the data didn't back that up. It See, wasn't in I'm fact saying. warming. So <clears throat> now it has changed into his, what... His position on, on global warming and all that stuff, I think, I think it's really just part of the narrative, part of his shtick to see if that was what the majority of the population was going to grab onto. Because believe me, our votes in presidential election, they don't really count. What happens is there is a selection process that takes place. I do believe that one thing that's important to note is that those, those candidates that you're going to see up on that stage and at those podiums and whatnot, uh, they are selected. And I believe what, what the powers that be are doing is they are trying to see which one of these people, all of the masses, that could be big, big trouble for these people if they just wake up and understand that they live in a nation of laws, that their leaders are extremely wicked and are in bed with uh, the Vatican and very nefarious forces that wish to do us great harm and put us under subjugation and a new revived inquisition. If people would wake up to that, it would be disastrous for the people who have been running things for quite some time in this country. So there is a certain selection that I believe they do. They put a number of people up on a stage, and what they want to do is they want to see which one of these that they've put up there are, uh, which one of these are um, all of us masses, us mindless masses going to respond to the most. And Cruz just happened to not be the one. It is the perfect political pseudoscientific theory, which is climate change. Now listen, as, as the son of two scientists, the scientific method is you begin with a hypothesis, and then you test that hypothesis with evidence. You try to prove is it true or false. Climate change is a perfect political theory because it can never be disproven. Whether it gets hot or cold, whether it gets wet or dry, no matter how it changes, it's always proven right. And the solution, yet again, is more and more government control of the economy in our lives. And I'll tell you who's So you being don't hurt. think anything should be done? I think this is driven by politicians that want more control over our lives. And, and, and but me, you, you think that the issue doesn't exist and should be ignored? Uh, I think I'm the, just trying to I understand your the, position on it. This woman should be ashamed of herself. To even call herself a reporter, she should be ashamed of herself. And she's not. And all of the people out there that actually call themselves reporters, that really actually put themselves out there as if they were people bringing to us the truth, they should all be ashamed of themselves. And they're not. It's, it's a horrible thought. Data is driven by politicians who have always supported more government control. And let me tell you who's being hurt on this. You know, it's interesting. The Democrats have made a very interesting political decision in the last few years. 
Barack Obama and Harry Reid and Hillary Clinton have chosen between two traditional favored children of the Democratic Party. They've chosen to go with the money from California environmentalist billionaires instead of the jobs of union members. Millions of union members are finding their jobs taken away. And I'll tell you what, I intend in this campaign so how he, he gets in to make a vote. hard run. I think Republicans ought to be fighting for those union members because the Democratic Party has abandoned union members. The union bosses are going to stay yeah. with the Democratic Party in See, all likelihood. What, is, what do unions but our have to do with climate change? is millions of hardworking men and women who want to work, who want to... Relentless you know, politician. Energy gives us the opportunity to bring manufacturing, heavy manufacturing, the steel That's industry, back to America. And the Democratic Party is more interested in money than they are interested in jobs. So basically, I'm just trying to understand your position on climate change. You think that it is unproven that it's happening and that nothing should be done as a result. And you still didn't really give me your opinion about the Pope's encyclical. Listen, I respect the Pope a great deal. He is a, a great theologian, a, and, and, and he has been speaking with, with, with great power, moving people to rediscover their faith. I, I commend him for that. In the world of public policy, I think we should follow the facts and, and the data. Yeah, okay, i got to stop it there. Because <clears throat> that right there should go to prove that... Guys like Ted Cruz, even though you can watch them uh, seemingly champion something like uh, the fallacy of climate change, at the end of the day, he too is either just a lover of himself and power and money, or is too afraid of the Pope and all of his secret armies to just come right out there and say well no look the pope put out this big encyclical on something that we have all kinds of hard data on showing that it is all a bunch of fear-mongering bogus rhetoric that is all meant to just push us further in the direction of depopulation and ultimately um, inquisition. So if the Pope wrote up this encyclical because he was ignorant of these things, well then maybe he needs to just be quiet, go around and wash more poor people's feet and and kiss more babies and just be, you know, and maybe he should just work more on his uh, nefarious uh, ecumenical agenda and leave the climate alone. Now, if it's not just a fact that he is ignorant and he is in fact a bald-faced liar, well, then I don't believe anyone should ever believe a single solitary word out of his lying mouth. Now you see, that is something that someone who is not driven by personal desires would say. Now, they might say it in a more polite way than the way that I just said it, but they would say it. They'd call a spade a spade. Okay, it, it, okay, now just imagine for a minute, any of you who are even vaguely familiar with Ian Paisley, who passed away not long ago, <clears throat> and if you're not familiar with him, go get familiar with him, Ian Paisley. Ian Paisley was a great example of how a man can be a man of God and can be involved in the government of his country and do right by his fellow man and absolutely do right by his God because that's the only way we're going to do right by our fellow man is by being obedient to our God first and foremost. But I could just imagine put Ian Paisley in place of Ted Cruz and imagine what he would say concerning these things for a minute. Get yourself in that headspace because that's what a man of integrity would say. Not all of these, these criminals, criminals, the whole lot of them, criminals.
It's a shame. But, you know, we don't get to sit here and just blame them. Nope. Absolutely not. The burden is on each and every one of us because, as I said, and I'm going to say it again, we've turned away from God. And until we turn back to God, this is what we're going to get. Maybe we're getting these things because God wants us to turn back to Him. Do we learn nothing from the nation of Israel in the Old Testament? We're getting this because we've turned away from God. Let us first turn back to God with all our hearts, not half-heartedly, but with all our hearts, no matter the cost. And then once we've done that, and we've removed the plank from our own eyes, we'll see better to remove the splinter out of our brother's eye, to spiritually and naturally appraise all things. So until next time, where we will go over uh, con number four, and this is all getting quite interesting, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about the Pope's encyclical and the Jesuits' influence on rewriting history. And uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about all of their sophistry and casuistry, which have directly contributed to the ignorance that most people have in this country and worldwide concerning science and the Bible and history and what is true and what is not true. So until next time, I really do hope that all of you are richly blessed in our Lord Jesus Christ. So, till then, Shabbat Shalom.